You're listening to the Platte River Bard. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Platte River Bard. This is Chris Berger. And I'm Sherry Berger. And welcome to our very special Halloween episode. Happy Halloween. Yes, happy Halloween. And we have a couple of Edgar Allan Poe selections for you this evening. We have a poem and a story. Yes, I talked Chris into doing some bard-like material for us for the holiday. Yes, it wasn't uh, Halloween for me until I heard Vincent Price read The Raven on the old Tonight Show. So I am no Vincent Price, but we'll give it a shot here and see how it goes. So uh, enjoy. The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. True. Nervous. Very... Very dreadfully nervous I have been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all, the sense of hearing is acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how the idea first entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes. It was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, thus ridding myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient enough for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to have seen how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very very slowly so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he laid upon his bed. (laughs) Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well within the room, I entered the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed and So it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in on him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, 
I was more than usually cautious than in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he, not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now, you may have think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not the groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with his dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. Or, it is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or, It is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes. He has been trying to comfort himself with all all these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out from the crevice and full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else 
of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And now I have not told you that what you mistake for madness is but an over-acuteness of the senses. Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet... I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder. Louder, I thought the heart was burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once. Ah! Once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It but not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes. He was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up uh, three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still as dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for... What have I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed him his treasures secure, undisturbed. 
In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot which beneath reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I, I fancied a ringing in my ears, but, but still they, they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It, it, it continued and became more distinct. I, I, I talked more frequently uh, to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and, and gained uh, definitiveness until, at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but, but I talked uh, more fluently and, and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It, it was a low, dull, quick sound, much uh, such as a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I, I gasped for breath, and, and yet the officers heard it not. I, I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it on the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty oh, God, no! No, they heard! They suspected! They knew! They were making a mockery of my horror! This I thought, and this I think, but anything was better than this agony! Anything was more tolerable than, than this derision! I could bear these hypocritical smiles no longer! I felt that I must scream or die! And now, again, hark louder, 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 louder! Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more! I admit the deed! Tear up the planks! Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart! The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden who the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. 
some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wandering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment in this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, then, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace above my chamber door perched and sat and nothing more then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou i said art sure no craven ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled at this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, that it utters its only stock and store caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never never more but the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling straight i wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door then, upon velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy on to fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. 
This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushions, velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee. By these angels he has sent thee respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate, yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted on this home by horror haunted tell me truly i implore is there is there balm in gilead tell me tell me i implore quoth the raven nevermore prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a saint and maiden who the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of thy lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave thy loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor Shall be lifted nevermore. Thank you for listening and supporting the arts in the Platte River area and beyond. Please subscribe to our podcast so you are sure to catch all of our future episodes and join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Music for this podcast was used with permission by Screaming Skull Productions. See you next time on the Platte River Bard.